Good morning, brothers and sisters. Welcome again to this morning's portion of this week's study. As we return to this document number 10, shall we ask our Heavenly Father to guide us and show us that which we should understand so that we might more clearly and properly be able to assess presentations that others give so we might more clearly stand with God to understand the presentations that we are to give at this time in earth's history. Shall we now ask his guidance in prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings that you have been providing. We thank you for your guidance and for your direction. Help us now, Father, so that your will may be done, so that we might more properly represent you with all of those with whom we come in contact. We struggle, Father, for we have sinned. We fall short of your glory. Help us now, direct us and guide us so that your character may be ever before us showing us that which we should attain. May your spirit enlighten our minds. May your angels surround us so that we might be able to address and understand that which you would have us to know at this time. I thank you for each one that is attending this meeting and for those that will view these later. Help us to these ends. Direct us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, now, under the heading, A House Divided Cannot Stand, this document continues. Now, in this, in all of what we have been addressing in this series of studies, We've come to this document, and in this, Glenn looks to produce and present two overriding principles. Do you recall what the first principle in this document was? Well, I don't. Well, one is it's not really a principle. So, right. I'm just going back to what he wrote. <laughs> yeah, so his principle in quotation marks is that um there's three powers, uh the dragon the beast and the false prophet, but he categorizes these as pagan Rome, papal Rome, the USA apostate Protestantism. I think that's what or paganism, papalism, yeah, Protestant prostate pro, Protestantism slash spiritualism. Right. So that he has as the dragon, the beast and the false prophet. So that's his his principle, his first principle. OK, his as he stated <clears throat> that in order to assess the role of atheism and Islam, we have to consider them in the context of paganism, papalism and a prostate. Yeah. Protestantism. Right, yeah. So he's addressing uh, atheism and Islam. This dichotomy that we have to choose between the king of the south is either atheism or Islam. Now, the, the issue here, he says that the second overriding principle is to consider that each of these entities, atheism and Islam, in concert with paganism, papalism, and apostate Protestantism, slash spiritualism are each at war in their own distinct way with God in the Bible. So in this stating that there are these five portions stating that each are at war with us at this time. Now, he states that Christ gives us an important principle when considering this in Matthew 12, 25 to 26. And Jesus knew their thoughts and said, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. 
and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? So, in this, in this type of situation, is he making a proper application in trying to say that this is a principle? Uh, you mean the second overriding principle or the yes. what Christ presents as, because Christ is presenting a principle there. That is a principle. Christ is, yes. Is Glenn but, presenting principle? No, no, it's not a principle. It's just an idea. Okay. And, and one thing is he calls it an overriding principle. Um, so an overriding principle is um, the principle above all principles. Right. That's why it's kind of hard to have two overriding principles. Mm-hmm. Like an overriding principle would be in, in the area of understanding knowledge is that God is the source of all wisdom. Right. Or the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That would be a principle. And that'd be the overriding principle in uh, uh, epistemology, you know, biblical epistemology. And a lot of other things would come from that, you know, the, the authority of God's word, etc. The situation here is that when you're when you're trying to say overriding, would you also agree that a synonym that could be used would be the supreme principle? Yeah. Overarching. Um, now, an overriding sort of implies that that um, uh, it's a principle that would also. Uh, um, eliminate some other things that people would have as ideas. So it would override, um, let's say, some beliefs as well, right? False beliefs. So if you had a principle, it could be overriding in the sense that it it, it uh, um, challenges some common ideas that you could use overriding in that sense as well. But but definitely there isn't a second overriding principle, and not, neither of these are principles. These are concepts that he wishes us to consider. So he could have used concepts, you know, or ideas. Okay. <clears throat> when we compare this scripture with others, we see that Satan is not at war with himself, but is actively and aggressively engaged in a war against God. Now he wants to compare verses from Revelation with Daniel. Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelation 13, 6 and 7, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Revelation thirteen fifteen, and he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Daniel seven twenty five, and he shall speak great words against the Most High, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Now here he follows with an ellipse. Now. If we're going to consider the entire verse, it would continue and say, and think to change times and laws, and they shall be given into his hand until a time and times and the dividing of time, which we would see as a prediction, a prophecy of the 1260. For the papacy. Correct. Revelation 11, 7. And when they, the Old and New Testament, shall have finished their testimony, the beast, atheism, that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit, shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. Now, here he's... Huh? That's wrong. 
Okay. But he's adding his own editorialism without really wanting to call it out. Yeah. And definitely we're not going to have um, yeah. Now I guess we could say, you know, this is is atheism, right? But really what we would put that this is um, okay. So the piece, the beast that it ascends out of the bottomless pit Okay. Would we just classify that as atheism? I wouldn't. Okay. Now we have um, so we have the beast that comes out of the sea in Revelation 13 verse 1. Right? And <clears throat> And we have the beast that comes out of the earth in Revelation 13, 11. And then in Revelation 17, <clears throat> um, verse 6, 7, and 8, right? And, and I'm just looking here at the, uh, the cross references given uh, by the translators of the King James. Right. Um, so the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. And they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. So what beast is that? Like when we look at, at, at Revelation 17. Um, and the other thing is in Revelation. So that's in Revelation 17. Now it's in Revelation 11 verse 7 that it talks about the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit. Right. Okay. But it's in Revelation 17 that we're going to again talk about it. So the question is, what is it talking about? Like, like he should do a study on this. Now, obviously, we know in Revelation chapter 11, we're dealing with the French Revolution. We have accepted that. Yeah. So if you're going to say that it's atheism, then in Revelation 17, uh, this beast uh, that ascends out of the bottomless pit, because it's going to be this woman, this whore, right? She's riding this beast, the seven heads and ten horns. Then you would have to argue that this beast is atheism, right? Because that's the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit. Does that make sense? Okay. And it says, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth. Now, that is, we're assuming that when it's referring to a beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, that it's referring to this beast here. But this beast, when you see this woman riding this beast, it doesn't say anything about this particular beast coming out of the bottomless pit. My understanding is the beast that comes out of the bottomless pit or shall ascend out of the bottomless pit is the beast of Revelation 13. So it rises out of the sea and that same beast is going to rise out of the bottomless pit. The people following what we're saying here. Anybody have questions? Do, do you want to bring those verses up there, Dwight? We're do you want uh, me to bring them up or? Just a moment. Let me see what I can do. Revelation 17. Right. For some reason on this computer, I have a hard time bringing up. Esword? Esword. It takes it forever to bring it up. Okay. Well, I, I can just bring it up. Yeah, because this is, this is telling me that Esword is not responding. Okay. Yeah. Well, on my old computer, I had that problem, but this this one here is, works great. Okay. Um, so I will. Here it comes, finally. Okay, you got it there. That's good. It's good. It's taking it forever. Yeah, you just have to uh, sh sh change your sharing there, what you're sharing. Okay. Okay, so we want Revelation 17. 
Yeah. Okay. So are you wanting Revelation 17, 6 to 8? Yeah. Can you do make it bigger with that little um, uh, plus sign there at the top of that the bar there? You can make your text bigger. Okay. Just a second. It's right above who with whom the kings of the earth, right above the word earth. Revelation. See that there? Yeah, there you hit that. And people can see it if they have a. Okay. Okay. Okay, Revelation 17, 6. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, and which hath the seven heads and the ten horns. The beast that thou sawest was and is not. And shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Okay. So now, before you go on, okay, you got something to say there? Well, as I'm looking at this, I would be initially taking, you know, what what he was trying to present. But combining it with your comment about how a study should be done, mm -hmm. I would be looking here at Revelation 13, 1. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Now, when we are looking at this and we are comparing it, with the verse that we read previously, the one that has the ellipse. Yeah. The problem and the the reason I would have to think that he placed the ellipse in this play in, in this area is when you're identifying this and combining it with the times, times, and dividing of times, you're not able to come through to this to say. This is atheism. You have to have this as being papalism. Well, yes. And, and, and that's where we run into this, this difficulty in Revelation 17 of how it's, it's been interpreted by this movement and by almost everyone. Right. Is when he's going to give this explanation of the woman and the beast upon which she rides that has seven heads and ten horns, right? The beast that carries her. So the mystery of the woman and the beast that carries her. Then he's going to say, the beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. So we know that this is a beast that was. It is not. And shall ascend. So... Right. So, so this characteristic is in antithesis to Christ, who, who was and is and and right. I can't remember the exact words, but you know he's e eternal, right? But he's never is not, right? Yeah. But here you have a beast that was and is not, and shall ascend, and um. Uh, let me see. There's these other ones. So, so with Christ, he was and is and is to come, right? But this beast, it was, is not, and yet is in Revelation uh, 17, verse 8. And, and also he shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, right? So he's got um, was, is not, and yet is. Um, and shall ascend to the bottomless pit. So he's got um, and go into perdition. Now, when he says he was and is not and yet is, that that's kind of interesting as well. Now, so I mean, we we spent time studying this, but I don't think we we fully have have finished the study of Revelation 17. No. But the one thing we can say is that. Um, we have the woman and we know who the woman is. 
right? This okay. is the papacy, right? The beast itself that she's riding, the, the scarlet colored beast, is a manifestation of civil power at the end of the world. So these beasts are related in the sense that they have seven heads and ten horns. We okay. know that the beast of Revelation 12 is going to give the beast of Revelation 13 its power, seed, and great authority. Right? Right. They're not, they're not the same beast, but they have characteristics that are the same. The seven crowns on the seven heads of the beast of Revelation 12, the great red dragon, and the leopard beast that has ten crowns on the ten horns, they're obviously different. And, and we could say they're different time periods, right, which they are, but but they're not exactly the same. It's not just it's the same beast in different time periods. W would you agree with that? Or some people might think it's the same beast in different time periods, but I don't think it's the same beast. I would see it as having to be different beasts. Yeah, like they're different beasts. You know, you have the pagan, pagan Rome, you have papal Rome. They're different beasts, but they have characteristics that are in common. But the fact that they have these these differences, which are definitely important differences mm -hmm. that don't just have to do with the time period. I mean, we could, you know, a person could argue that uh, they are the kingdoms of this world in a symbolic way. And in that way, they kind of are the same beast. Right. Does that make sense? Right. So but but the kingdom of, of the world are not the same kingdoms throughout all time. Right. We have Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome. That, but we know that Rome. In its synchronistic, syncretistic form, it takes into itself it. it subsumes, we said, or absorbs all of these other characteristics of these other kingdoms. So when we have a beast that thou sawest that was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, part of the problem that people have argued here um, is the perspective. So Uriah Smith is going to argue uh, that the seven heads are the seven forms of Roman government in all of the beasts. Right. Right. And then he's going to argue that the time in which John is, is viewing this uh, uh, is where we're going to look at the present tense. So the present tense, it is not, well, that is the period in Imperial Rome when John has his vision. Right whatever year it would be at the end of the uh, the last decade of the first century. So 96 ADs, common date. So he's going to have this vision at that time. And at that time, uh, can we say that the beast is not? Because that's one of the problems that we have here, is trying to figure out the time frame in which the is not is, Right. Yeah. In in other words, figuring out the time frame in which the is not occurs. Yeah. Yeah. So now the way that we've commonly looked at it is we'd say, well, it received a deadly wound. One of the heads received a deadly wound. Now, the one that receives the deadly wound is the papacy in 1798. Right. That's the head of and, and we say that in Revelation 13 that the seven heads do represent Babylon, Medo, Persia, Greece, Rome, pagan, Rome, papal, etc. Right. Okay. And we, we've taken that position that that is correct for that beast. But that's not true of the beast of Revelation 12, that the seven heads do not represent the seven kingdoms, but represent seven forms of Roman government. <clears throat> Right. That that's the position we've taken. Um, and then um, in Revelation 17, we've taken the position that the seven heads are the seven mountains or the seven hills of Rome upon which the woman sitteth. So when it talks about the beast that was and is not and yet is or that shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, we take that to be. 
the beast of Revelation 13 that he's referring to. So in order to explain the woman who's riding this beast that he sees in Revelation 17, he's going to refer him back to Revelation 13. Right? Okay. To the beast that receives the deadly wound. And so when we put it into that context, we can see that this beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit has to be the papacy. Well, in, in this in this situation, yeah. as the verse reads, and as I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. So here's a beast rising up out of waters, out of the sea, out of peoples. Yeah. And that's when it's going to arise um, in, in its initial, the papacy initially, right? We know at the end right. of the world, the papacy is going to be there again. But initially, it's going to rise up out of the sea, out of uh, Europe. Right. Now, when, when we are looking at the portion of Revelation 17... When we consider this, the beast that thou saw that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, isn't that when it says the bottomless pit, is that a busos? Yeah. Okay. That's the and we'll go into perdition. So, could this be the beast that thou sawest giving us reference to what was occurring between 508 and 538? Okay. Um, well, as far as when it ascends out of the bottomless pit, that's a later manifestation of this power. Correct. Right. <clears throat> Um, okay, so the one in 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 Revelation 11, because that's where he's going to put in that it's atheism, right? Um, right. Revelation 11, 7 that he quotes, which is the one where he puts the ellipses? He had that in Revelation 13. Okay, Revelation 13. Yes, okay, that's right. So in Revelation 11, 7, he just quotes the verse, okay. Um, Excuse me. He had the ellipses in Daniel seven twenty five. Okay. Okay. Seven twenty five. Okay. Yeah. So it's going to first talk about the two witnesses, right? So the Old and New Testament that they're going to—that's uh, God's word. And in they're, you know, obviously, verse 5, and if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies, right? So that has to do with the prophecies. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And when they have, shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead body shall lie in the street with, of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom in Egypt. Now, obviously, we know that this is going to be during the French Revolution. That's what we've accepted. Yeah. Now, if we're talking about this beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit to just say that it's atheism. Then you have to explain what that means. Right, because we have no beast. The only beast that it tells us that ascends out of the bottomless pit is in Revelation 17 when it's referring to the beast that was and is not, and yet is, that shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. And it says it shall at some point. So so we have to sort that out. That it's 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 not just so straightforward to say, well. This is atheism. This is, 
even if you argue that it's France, is where do we see France as a beast descending out of the bottomless pit, except here? And, and why is it a beast? You, you understand what I'm saying? It, it must be referring to something, to some beast that has been mentioned before. It's not going to describe this beast at all. You, you see the problem, hopefully. People yes. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, so, so how do we answer this question? We're, we we can't say it's atheism. Yeah, because a- atheism does not fit. And if we're applying Miller's rules, we have to apply all of the verses that have something to do with this to see if our theory is correct. Okay. So, so we know France has a part to play in this. Correct. Right. Obviously, this is going to be dealing with what what happens in France regarding God's word. Now, we know that the Catholic Church has also made war against God's word. So and and I wish I was more of an expert on the French Revolution. Um, So what what's the progress of events? So we're going to have So anybody can give us just a quick uh, description of what happened during the French Revolution. When it started, and and uh, I mean, I know smatterings of it, but I don't know if I could put it all together. Okay, let's see. Just I don't know the order of events. Eight, 1789 to seventeen ninety nine, according to Wikipedia. They have May 5th, 1789 to November 9th, 1799. That's what they have. So 10 years, so this, 10 years, six months, four days. <clears throat> okay. So the start of the French Revolution would have the, been the storming of the Bastille on the 14th of July of 1789. Yeah. So that's, that's, some people give that date, some people give others. But why do they put the May? 5th, 1789, instead of July 14th, 1789. Just because of the crisis that happened in May? I, right. see, I would probably take I'd probably take the storming of the Bastille. You know, I would I would usually take like something dramatic like that to start it. So I'm I'm just going just down a quick timeline. They have a convocation of the Estates General, which was con- con- converted into a National Assembly in June. So I guess that's why they take May 5th. So there's this social distress. In May 5th to 1789, they have a convocation of the Estates General, and that is converted into a National Assembly. Um, and you're, in- you're asking, I mean, that one, uh, the meeting was originally called on the 24th of January. And then it came to pass on the 5th of May. You're right. Yeah. Okay. So that's why they give May 5th. So, I mean, so the actual date, it it depends on how we determine it, you know. Um, So some of the main uh, events, what else do you got? What happened next? Let's, why don't we do this, you know, while, while we're going through this? Why don't we, I can read off different events and we could put it on a line to see what we can come out with okay so you want me to bring a line up yeah okay okay just hang on here okay well i'll share my screen i guess here see how this works okay you can see that there okay so i just got a line here this is just uh, another line i copied and uh Get rid of some of this. Okay, so we're going to have uh, these different dates, and we'll be so, able to move, we'll be able to move a lot of this around as we go. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, if we start with 14th of July, 1789. Okay. Okay. So there we got that. 
wouldn't wouldn't that be the time of the end for um, France? It, it's possible, but what we want to do first is in a line is to make the line, and then we'll then we'll make other applications. Okay, so I'll just put Bastille there. Yeah, storming of the Bastille. Yeah, just 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 a reminder, shorthand. Okay, that's fine. Okay, yeah. so that's one. Women's March on Versailles, October 5th, 1789. Okay. Um, so what's the significance of that? It's a reaction to the fact that the price of bread was so high that people could not feed their families. Hmm. Nothing to do with let them eat cake thing? No. <laughs> Okay, because I, I think that's earlier. Um, okay, so that's going to be October 5th. 5th. The Women's March? Women's March. Okay. Okay, so we have the Women's March. So when they're when the women are marching on Versailles, they are marching on the palace. They're marching against the king. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, that's going to be the first thing is we got to get rid of the king. Um, and, okay, next. Okay. I'm still looking. Okay. June 1789. So we're going to have to go. Back, back back a little bit. Yeah. Okay, so you want to put something else in here. So so June 1789. It has to occur before the the Bastille. Okay. So June what? June 20th. Okay, so that's even earlier. Okay. So what was that? They called it the tennis court oath. Okay, we got an oath there. They, they wanted a new constitution. Oh, that sounds familiar. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Hearing the news. Aren't we, aren't we seeing that now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so how does that tennis court oath come about? Why is it called the tennis court? And well, the third estate became the National Assembly. So we could we could say that this became something equivalent to the U.S. House of Representatives. Okay. So that's when they become the National Assembly is on June 20th. You're saying or no? That's that's the way it looks. Okay. Just why do they call it the tennis court oath? Okay. Just a moment. I don't have a direct answer. I'm just, okay. they met on the, they protested on the tennis court of the estate's general building. So okay. they call it the tennis court oath. Okay. Okay. Now we got to go one further back. Okay. On May 5th. Yeah. So that's the one that they had. We have this on the Estates General. So we have the Estates General calling. Okay. Other things? I'm looking. Now. In July 12th of 1790. Okay, July 12th. So a year and two days after the Bastille storming. We have the civil constitution of the clergy. Okay, so this is the thing that's interesting to me is just where, what part the church has to play in this. So it's July 12th, so it's one year, less two, less two days, right? Right. 
1790. Um, let me just say clergy there, just to remind me. Well, it's interesting that they call it the civil constitution of the clergy. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting too. And then Jeff's writing all over my uh, paper, putting little red dots there. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. Okay. Now. Okay. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. I was trying to get to the bottom here. Yeah, okay. September 1792. The monarchy is abolished. Okay. So, September what? Um, September 21st of 1792. Okay. Now, what's involved in the abolishment of the monarchy? Who's involved in that? Well, this is this is what sets up the French Republic. Okay. September 21st. Yep. 1792. What's the best way to abbreviate that? Uh, First Republic, so one ST Republic. I'm looking for something very quickly. Okay, so the making of the First Republic, that's kind of interesting. Um, uh, what's interesting to me, now at that time in 1792, I'm assuming the French had adopted the Gregorian calendar. Well, the, the, yeah, they 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 have the Gregorian calendar. Uh, it, originally, they did it before the U.S. and Britain, right? So they did it initially when it was uh, they adopted the the calendar in whatever it was, fifteen eighty two. Okay, the Gregorian calendar. So they've had that. They had that before England did. England didn't take it until seventeen fifty two. So we're talking on a biblical time. Uh, September 21st of 1792 would have been the fifth day of the seventh month. Okay. Now. Okay. So we have the. Okay. Uh, Louis the Sixteenth executed on the twenty-first of January of seventeen ninety-three. Okay. Twenty-first of January. Twenty-first of January, seventeen ninety-three. Okay. Um, Louis the Sixteenth. Yes. Executed or ex whatever. Chopped. Now, when are they going to start? Killing the 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 priests and all that. Well, I'm I'm just going through this timeline trying. I to understand, change. My understanding is that the priests are still involved in the revolution. They 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 think that they're on the because it's going to start. Um, if I got it correct, so I could be completely wrong, but the church seems to be behind the revolution at first. Correct. Correct. Okay. But then, of course, they don't expect the turn that's going to happen where it comes against the church as well. Okay. Now, add Marie Antoinette's execution. Okay. So she's going to be executed. 16th of October, 1793. Not sure how you spell that. A N T O I N E T T E. Okay, I did it right. Of course you did. <laughs> Not of course. I'm terrible at spelling names. 
Everybody spells them differently. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Now, it's interesting because <clears throat> as I'm as I'm going through all of this, the Constitution of 1791 was created in hopes of creating a better government where the monarchy was not as powerful. The Constitution was replaced by the three estates, the ones that we were addressing in the tennis court oath. Okay. Okay. So the monarchy was abolished. Okay, we, we put that down as September 21st, 1792, which is correct. Yeah, that's when they become the first republic. Right. Now, the Constitution. So there was a French Constitution of 1791, of 1793, and of 1795, which then became the French Constitution of 1799. So there's four constitutions here. Okay. Okay, I won't put those on the line yet, but I'll put them here and then I'll figure that out. So we got uh, these constitutions. This is stupid. I'm not sure why it's not working. The one in 1795 is the one that established the five-man directory. Okay, so you got these constitutions. Right. And you got uh, the first one. Just a moment. You should have 1791. Yeah, what date? Do they have a date? I'm looking. I'm going as quick as I can. Okay. So we've got 1791, 1793, 1795, and 1799. Okay, so we're going to have these different ones, but you don't have specific dates for them? I'm, I'm still looking. Uh, according to the French, 1791 would be 3rd of September. Okay. 1793. Not finding a date of 1793. I'm going to have to do further searching. Okay. 1795. It, okay. Adopted by convention. Five. Fructidor. Year three. Okay. So... Um, yeah, I'm just going to look here. So what we got is. But it was approved on 6th of September. Okay, so I'm looking right now at the French Republican uh, calendar here. Okay. We got um, the third year. Which month? Fructidor? Fructidor. And what date? Five. Okay, so just quint, quintito, quintiti. Okay, so that's August 22nd, 1795. Okay. Okay, so, which is interesting. Okay. But it's apparently approved on 6th of September later, because if this is October, it's got to be approved sometime after that. Okay, but yeah, so for now, I'm just going to put the uh, August 22nd date. Okay. August 22nd or October 22nd? It's August 22nd. Okay. It's Because you said it's the 5th of Fructidor. All right. So if it's August 22nd, then it's approved um, 15 days later on the 6th of September. Okay. I won't put that in there now, though. Okay, and then we have the fourth one is in 1799. That's going to be... Now, Now the real event is is those three and a half days. That's the thing that I'm interested in, where we put that. 
Agreed. <clears throat> That's what the, we did at first. The fourth constitution is what established the consulate and gave dictatorial powers to the first consul, Napoleon Bonaparte. Okay, and the date? I'm looking. And that November 9th, 1799 date would, because that's going to be one of the dates that's going to end this line. But uh, you're correct, because that's that's where he overthrew the directory. The Constitution was adopted 24th of December, 1799. Okay. And was confirmed on the 7th of February of 1800. Okay. Okay. Anyway, we'll put that there. So what about that three and a half days that uh, we have for three days and a half? They're going to lie dead in the streets, right? The two witnesses. You know, I should have these kinds of dates remember, memorized, but I've never presented them. So that's why I don't remember them. I know I've seen them before. Well, I'm I'm still looking for several other things. Okay. Um, so we have three days and a half or three and a half years. So the reign of terror began 1793 when Louis XVI was beheaded on January 21st. And I'm sure. Religion, I'm October 5th, 1793. Uh, okay, the two witnesses killed. Okay. Uh, have have we considered the meeting of the National Convention that went from September of 1792 to October 26th of 1795? No. Yeah, this is going to take a little bit to sort out. Agreed. Uh, Okay, but the three and a half days, where do we traditionally put that three and a half days? I guess I could find that uh, here. Um, I uh, I dealt with that in table of history. Yeah, okay. So I think, it, I think it is from the 21st of January. Well, this is what I understood anyway. From the execution so, of Louis XVI? Yes. Okay. Now, and, why uh, why would that be marking when the three witnesses lie dead in the streets? I would have to look at table history again as to why that application was made. There was somebody involved, and you looked at that and made this application, and that's that's the one I went with. Went with. I didn't know anything else. Okay. Okay. I think somebody somebody Crawley. I think somebody was his name. You you have yeah. that from 1793 to 1797. Uh, it's interesting because your footnote 126 shows war on the two witnesses. And you're making the application from Great Controversy 269, paragraph 1, along with Revelation 11, 7 through 10. Now, Uriah Smith says in 1793, decree passed in the French assembly for forbidding the Bible. And under the, that decree, the Bibles were gathered and burned and every possible mark of contempt heaped upon them and all institutions of the Bible abolished. The Sabbath was blotted out and every 10th day substituted for mirth and profanity. Baptism and the communion were abolished. The being of God was denied and death pronounced to be an ex eternal sleep. And the goddess of reason was set up. But he doesn't really have solid dates for that. Well, Mrs. White, from what Stephen quoted in Table of History, uh, yeah. using Great Controversy 1888, page 269, paragraphs 3 and 4. According to the words of the prophet, then, a little before the year 1798, some power of satanic origin and character would rise to make war upon the Bible. And in the land where the testimony of God's two witnesses should thus be silenced, 
there would be manifest the atheism of the Pharaoh and the licentiousness of Sodom. This prophecy has received a most exact and striking fulfillment in the history of France. During the revolution of 1793, the world for the first time heard an assembly of men uplift their united voice to deny the most solemn truth which man's soul receives and renounce unanimously the belief and the worship of the deity. Okay, that's Great Controversy, 1888. 269.3 and 4. Yeah, the Bible is after the Bible in the French Revolution. Right. That's on tabled history, page 52. Yeah. Now she's going to mention, okay, so she talks about, said the angel of the Lord, the holy city shall they tread underfoot 40 and two months. This is page 266. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred threescore days clothed in sackcloth. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, and shall overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the, that, the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom in Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them, and make merry, and shall send gifts one to another, because... These two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. And they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them, which saw them. Then she goes back. The period here mentioned, 42 months, 1,203 score days are the same, like representing the time in which the church of Christ was to suffer oppression from Rome. Right. So we understand all of this about the 1,260 days. So the persecution of the church continues through that period of time. And she says, concerning the two witnesses, uh, the prophet declares further, there are two olive, they are, these are two olive trees and the two candlestick sticks standing before the God of the earth. Thy word said the psalmist is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path, right? So she shows how this is the Old and New Testament. Um, and they prophesy for 1260 days. Right. So that's the main idea. Um, and when they finish their testimony, she quotes that again. Uh, so she says this ends in 1798. As they were approaching the termination of their work in obscurity, war was to be made upon them by the power represented as the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit. In many of the nations of Europe, the powers that ruled in church and state had for centuries been controlled by Satan through the medium of the papacy. But here's brought to new a new manifestation of satanic power. So we dealt with that before, this new manifestation of satanic power. So um, he, he is arguing that this new manifestation of satanic power is a new power, right? Correct. That's what he was arguing about. Uh, it had been Rome's policy under a profession of reverence for the Bible to keep it locked up in an unknown tongue and hidden away from the people. Under her rule, the witness witnesses prophesied clothed in sackcloth. But another power, the beast that ascended, or the beast from the bottomless pit, was to arise to make open avowed war upon the word of God. The great city in whose street streets the witnesses are slain and where their dead bodies lie is spiritually Egypt. Of all nations presented in Bible history, Egypt most boldly denied the existence of the living God and resisted his commands. No monarch ever ventured upon more open and high-handed rebellion against the authority of heaven. Then, then did the king of Egypt. Right. So he's, she's going to show. Um, then she says, uh, quoting this, you know, who is Jehovah that I should hearken unto his voice to let Israel go? I know not Jehovah. Moreover, I will not let, let Israel go. This is atheism. The nation represented by Egypt would give a voice similar to a similar denial of the claims of the living God and would manifest a like spirit of unbelief and defiance. The great city is also compared spiritually to Sodom, and the corruption of Sodom in breaking the law of God was especially manifest, manifested in licentiousness. This sin was also to be preeminent characteristic of the nation that should fulfill the specifications of the scripture. So we would have to say that that uh, um, 
the way to look at this is France is going to arise, right? Now, the question is, how is France the beast out of the bottomless pit, right? Well, the idea is that it's a new manifestation of satanic power, right? According to the words of the prophet, then a little before 1798, some power of satanic origin and character would rise to make war upon the Bible. And in the land where the testimony of God's two witnesses should thus be silenced, there would be manifest the atheism of the Pharaoh and the licentiousness of Sodom. The prophecy received a most exact, exact and striking fulfillment in the history of France. During the revolution in 1793, the world for the first time had heard an assembly of men, born and educated in civilization, assuming the right to govern one of the finest of the European nations, uh, uplift, their, uplift their united voice to deny the most solemn truth which man's soul receives and renounce unanimously the belief and worship of a deity. That's from Sir Walter Scott, Life of Napoleon. Um, France is the only nation in the world concerning which authentic record survives that as a nation she lifted up her hand and opened rebellion against an author of the universe. That's going to be from Blackwoods Magazine. So she's going to go through some of this history here. Uh, but she's not going to give us any dates specifically other than 1893. Okay. Okay, she then is going to quote this passage. The beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. The atheistical power that ruled in France during the revolution and the reign of terror did wage such a war against God and his holy word, as the world had never witnessed. Uh, the worship of the deity was abolished by the National Assembly. Bibles were collected and publicly burned with every possible manifestation of scorn. The law of God was trampled underfoot. The institutions of the Bible were abolished. The weekly rest day, etc., was set aside. Um, okay, so what would we argue then the beast that ascends... Seven, yeah, I meant 1793. What did I say? 1973. Um, you said 18. Oh, okay. 18, yeah, 17, 1793. Yeah. Um, okay, so if we are going to put this, we do have an atheistical power, right? That That is connected with this beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit. But would we just say that it's atheism or does the beast have to be a kingdom? And how do we have France as a beast? Right. You, you see some of the problems we're running into here. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And, and so, I mean, I'm not going to fault him that much for just saying it's atheism, but we, we would have to say that it, so if you are arguing that you have a beast that represents atheism and a beast that represents the United States and a beast that represents paganism or pagan Rome and a beast that represents papal Rome, and then you're going to say there's a beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit, um, then, you know, we really have to look at Revelation 17 a little bit differently. We have to try to figure out what she's taught, what what um, Ellen White's talking about here in context with what the Bible says, and and I don't think we understand this yet. Here. So I, I'm going to get you. I'm going to stop sharing the screen. I'll come back to this later. This chart. Um, we'll figure that out later. You can share your screen again. Go back to his document here. Okay. Um, I have to stop my share. So, after we've read these verses, the next statement that is made is the prevailing point to make concerning the role of atheism in Islam is their relation to the papacy, it is to recognize that they are each in a common war against God, his word, and his people. They are each satanic in nature. While there may be competing factions and rivalries within the government of evil. They are all engaged in a desperate war against God 
and are united in singleness of purpose under the leadership of Satan. We are told that Satan is a wise general. Okay, Harry, I, have a, I have a comment here. Yes. Um, so I was watching a, uh, a video on YouTube, and the guy was talking about uh, how France is the first nation. That, that it's the oldest nation. Now, of course, one of that has to do with the def definite definition of what a nation is. So he makes this argument that prior to France, um, that countries obviously existed, but the idea of a nation hadn't existed until France. And that is that the people are associated with the country in which they live. That is, uh, countries used to be just territories in which an elite ruled over, but the people themselves weren't considered uh, part of that, that country. Like you didn't have people that would consider themselves all French, right? Or all, you know, all German. Does that make sense, what, what I'm saying? There, or is, so this is an argument he makes that France is the first nation, is how we understand nations. So people wouldn't have identified, that, you know, like now I live in Canada, I'm a Canadian, right? People wouldn't have identified uh, their nationality, right? They might identify their ethnicity. They might belong to a certain tribe or a certain uh, uh, class of people but they wouldn't identify as German or French or Spanish or, uh, you know, Italian. Does that make sense? Or do you think that this guy's just wrong? From the YouTube video or this document? In, in the YouTube video that the guy had. And, and he's, he's, he's um, you know, one of these guys, he does lots of presentations on all kinds of factual stuff. Can't remember his name offhand. Um, but his argument was kind of interesting, especially in the context of what we're talking about. Now, we just think of nations because we live in a time in which nations exist. Um, so according to Wikipedia, a nation is a type of social organization with, with, where a collective identity and national identity has emerged from a combination of shared features um, across a given population, such as language, history, ethnicity, culture, territory, or society. Some nations are constructed around ethnicity. Um, and, oops, I skipped there. Oh, where are we here? Um, while others are bound by political constitutions. Now, I don't know if, you know, to argue that France is the first nation uh, because the word nation existed long before we ever had, um, you know, the French Revolution. So, you know, I guess part of it is just how somebody is defining a word. But, you know, nations existed in the Middle Ages here, according to Wikipedia. Um, Uh, yeah, so they so that words existed for a long time. I'm um, just reading here a bit more. I've heard people argue that Nimrod was the first king of like a first nation. So the argument there is that before Nimrod, you had people just the chief of tribes and so forth. Mm -hmm. But uh, Nimrod. Was different because he brought different tribes together as in one collective area, that type right. of thing that they could all identify with. Right. So it depends how you're defining a nation, right? So one thing I do know is that when you have like the Babylonian Empire, uh, you know, people wouldn't necessarily identify themselves as Babylonian, right? Just because Babylon is is the kingdom in which they're in. Right. That is, people didn't have a national identity that that's what we're talking about here. 
So definitely a change happened with France. However, you're going to define nation. Obviously, countries existed, nations existed beforehand. But in the context of what he's talking about, um, it would be some kind of nationalism that that arises that wouldn't have existed in the past. So nationalism, an idea or movement that holds that a nation should be congruent with the state as a movement, it presupposes the existence and tends to promote the interest of a particular nation. Um, but yeah, so how to have uh, a national identity, right? Because you can have a national identity, even though people have different ethnicity, um, even different languages, different religions, different traditions. Um, but you can still have a national identity. So um, it says here, this is in Wikipedia's article on nationalism, beginning in the late 18th century, put, century, particularly with the French Revolution and the spread of the principle of popular sovereignty or self-determination. The idea that the people should rule is developed by political theorists. Three main theories have been used to explain the emergence of nationalism. And so it's going to go into... Uh, that. So definitely the idea of nationalism becomes, uh, uh, which is something that wouldn't really have existed long before that. So, so it's really part of it is just definitional, what we mean by a nation. But the point here, I guess, in this context, if we're going to be dealing with what he's saying, um, I don't think we should put that the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit is atheism. I think we should just simply say it's France. Do people agree or not? I think this is a point to consider because we're coming to the coming to the close of our time today, yeah. and we've got. We basically have gone through most of one page of his 10 page document. Yeah, but this this brings up this really important point that we've never addressed here right. is what it means they ascend out of the bottomless pit. Um, because the bottomless pit has to do with its satanic origin, right? And he's making some assumptions here, uh, which I've seen other people try to use in the case that. Um, we're going to have this in Revelation 9, the fifth angel sounds. We see the star fall from heaven. That's Muhammad, right? right? And to him was given a key to the bottomless pit. And then he's going to open the bottomless pit, and you're going to have the smoke out of the pit as the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the air darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit, right? And then you're going to have these locusts uh, come out of the smoke, and uh, and they're going to have uh, the power as scorpions, right? Right. So we're going to know that this is Islam. Now, the question is, we have this uh, bottomless pit here. Uh, it's the same same words, right? And so some people try to to connect uh, Islam to atheism, right? You understand what I'm saying? To right. the to the king of the south. That's one of the reasons they would put it as king of the south is because the king of the south is atheism and Islam then is out of the bottomless pit. So it's also atheism. Right. So you, you can see how people can just take these verses, put them together without considering everything. So this is um, so this is something we have we've never really addressed. We've we've touched on it in the past. But we've never really figured this out. Okay. And of course, Revelations eleven seven is important as a symbol, right? Because you could take it as eleven times seven is seventy seven plus also eleven times seventeen. You can take the the one and add it to the seven there. And we know that's 187. So that's as a symbol, 117 can also represent July 18. Um, so it's 
So maybe there's something that we're missing in, in our understanding of these. And the, and the fact that it calls this a beast, that it's going to say that this a beast sends out of the bottomless pit. And yet it hasn't shown a beast sending out of the bottomless pit. But later on, you're going to see this beast descending out of the bottomless pit, the beast of Revelation 17. Right? And yet it talks about this beast. Now, could we argue then? Um, so I know you, we, we got like one minute left, but think about this for tomorrow. So could we argue that um, when France brings about this deadly wound to the papacy, that there is a connection with the fact that this is the beast that ascends out of the bottomless pit? And in Revelation 17, when we see this beast uh, with seven heads and ten horns, that is going to be the future manifestation of the papacy with this woman riding on it, right? So you have this beast, this woman riding on it. Um, that somehow that's connected, that there's something that we need to see about that connection. Because in Revelation 17, it's going to mention the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit. So does that make sense as, as something to study and figure out? Yes. How, okay. Because I, I think we've missed something, personally. Well, if it's France, how would that then impact the application that the USSR then takes on the role of the King of the South? Yeah. Yeah, and then it passes to the UN. Mm -hmm. So, so we could argue that the bottomless pit is is definitely satanic, but the, that ascends out of the bottomless pit. I mean, it would be France, not atheism. So, well, I wouldn't say France. I would say maybe because France existed since five oh eight, in the sense or even. Before that, you could say, so I wouldn't say France, I would say maybe revolutionary France. Okay, revolutionary. So we need to define what that is. I mean, is I mean, because it is a kingdom, right? A beast is a kingdom. Okay, so I have a question. Yeah. The the premise that we're all stating right now, you, mm -hmm. myself, Stephen, we have a progression from Egypt to France to Russia to the UN. Yeah. Does this have a parallel in the four constitutions that the French used? I don't know. I'd have to look at the four constitutions, but... I mean, you could even put it further. I mean, you could add more in there. So I don't know about the four. Anyway, it's something. There's something we're missing. Right. Right. That we haven't we haven't sorted through yet. But definitely, I don't think you could just label the beast as atheism, because the beast is a kingdom. Correct. Well, we understand that, and symbols can have more than one representation. Yeah, but this so this must but but this must be something not just an idea like atheism. Right. So we we have a lot to cover. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we are at the end of our time together. I apologize. I said that this document was ten pages. It's eight, but we barely made it through to the halfway point. Mm -hmm. So do we have any other comments or questions at this time? Shall we then close in prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you and we praise you for showing us that which we need to consider. We ask today for your guidance, your blessing, and your watch care over all that you would have us to do. May your will be done. May we gratefully lay our plans at your feet to be taken up or laid aside as you so direct. 
Help us now, Father. May your spirit guide us. May your angels protect us. May your will be done. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.